Hey CW Apes, Mr. Kennedy here. These are your chapter six lecture notes on ecosystems and living things. Today, we're gonna dive into just a few simple ideas relating to the evolution and production of species diversity, species interactions and how they shape a biological community, some community properties and how they affect species populations, and then how communities can change over time. All of this starts with the answer to, well, a very simple question that I will pose to you. Why do some species live in one place but not another? Realistically, the answer to that question is, well, all centered around the idea of adaptation. At the end of the day, an adaptation is a trait that allows a species to survive in the environment. If you're lucky and you're born with advantageous adaptations, well, then you'll be successful in the environment that you're in. If you're not born with advantageous adaptations, well, there's really three options for you if you're an animal and two if you're a plant. Those three options if you're an animal are, number one, leave, okay? Get out of there. Um, go find some place where you're comfy. Um, number two, figure it out. Figure out a way to adapt. Number three, that's the harsh one, die. Okay, that's all there is to it. Um, you can leave, you can adapt, or you'll die. In terms of plants, they can't get up and leave, so they either have to figure out how to adapt or they will die. This idea is a central point in Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, which is what we're going to explore next. In Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, um, his idea is that species, populations of species, will change over time as a result of, well, the adaptations that they may or may not possess and how those adaptations um, translate to success in their environment. Now, those adaptations have to be heritable. So they have to be things that can be passed genetically. For example, if Mr. Kennedy goes out and gets a face tattoo, you know, like Mike Tyson, um, I don't care how cool I think I look in the mirror, at the end of the day, my kids aren't going to be born with a face tattoo. So that's not a heritable adaptation. If, however, I was a ground squirrel and I had like brown fur and I lived in an area that was predominantly, well, covered with brown vegetation, well, that would be an advantageous adaptation that I could pass on fur color, hair color, um, eye color, skin color, like other things like that, those are heritable adaptations. If I was an unlucky ground squirrel living, you know, in an area surrounded by brown vegetation and I don't know, I was born with white fur, um, I'd stick out like a sore thumb and predators would probably pick me off and eat me. Now, it doesn't matter if they pick me off and eat me before or after I reproduce. At the end of the day, having white fur in an area where the vegetation is brown is bad, right? I'll, I could get eaten before I reproduce, at which point my genes stop there. Or like if I somehow manage to not get eaten, well, my, my offspring are going to be at a disadvantage because, well, they have white fur. And eventually, over time, our squirrel population, well, it should be all squirrels with brown fur. That's the idea of natural selection playing out in a population and changing its appearance over time. So at the end of the day, we're gonna talk about evolution this way. It's basically like individuals with traits that make them suited to an environment can survive and reproduce at a greater rate that, you know, than anybody else can. Like, so the browns, ground squirrels, like they're gonna survive and reproduce at a higher rate than the white ones, okay? So if we move on from here, um, really what natural selection is all about is like a filtering or a selection process that kind of picks out genes and traits that, for lack of a better way to put it, um, are, well, less than advantageous for the environment that you're in. And that's what causes the change over time. What selects or what is picking out or what is filtering those genes? We'll get to that in a second, but I'll just give you a hint for now. It has a lot to do with predators, that whole predator-prey relationship thing, um, and other tensions and pressures that are put on the members of that population externally. Um, now, it is possible for new traits to occasionally show up in a population. Now, 
when this happens, basically what we're talking about is that offspring um, can show a trait or a condition that neither of their parents had, right? The only way we can really ever expect this to happen is through a process called mutation. Every so often, it's very, very rare, but like a mutation can lead to the development of a trait that neither parent had. So you could think of it as like a ground squirrel being born with like a lucky birthmark or something like that, right? So if I have two brown ground squirrels and they mated, maybe one of their offspring gets like this lucky, you know, black for birthmark that like helps it be even better camouflaged than its parents okay so the parents still might get picked off by predators but because lucky ground squirrel with black you know birthmark like is better camouflaged than it's going to reproduce at a higher rate and be more successful than the parents and whoa over time like the whole population of ground squirrels that are descendant from like that group that had that lucky birthmark well they're all going to have lucky birthmarks and that's natural selection that's how it works okay now outside of natural selection um, in that aspect I want you to kind of be able to wrap your brain around like all of the things that are putting pressure on populations okay and if we put it under one umbrella we're gonna call them limiting factors limiting factors come in two big grand forms you have density dependent factors and density independent factors if it's a dependent factor then the bigger the population gets the more stress that uh, that factor is going to put on the population right so think about food or mates or something like that like the bigger the population gets the more you're gonna have to fight for that stuff um, density independent factors doesn't matter how big the population is like the pressure is always going to be the same so like if there's two individuals living here you know where we live um, and it's 110 degrees outside those two individuals are going to be hot and sweaty if there's two million individuals that live in the same area and it's 110 outside then there's going to be two million people that are hot and sweaty so like temperature you know like rainfall those would be like density independent factors so here's a list of some things that we got to deal with that can affect like natural selection or change in the population over time Physiological stress, like I said, inappropriate levels of moisture, temperature, pH, light, and nutrients. Competition with other species. Like if, you, if you're spending your time fighting for resources, like that's not conducive to like reproducing and passing on your genes safely. Predation, parasitism, disease, that should be self-explanatory. And then yes, there is a certain aspect of speciation or species distribution and change over time that well it's blind dumb luck like think about the valley grassland that we live in like there are palm trees that persist in this area it's a valley grassland it's supposed to have like grasses not palm trees so how did they get here well blind dumb luck maybe a human came in one day and said you know I'd really like to have a palm tree in my yard so they planted one and from that point on palm trees like you know figured out that they could tolerate whatever the environment was throwing at them and have since been reproducing and distributing themselves throughout our ecosystem. That brings us to this idea of tolerance. Um, there's two names that I want you to be familiar with. Von Liebig, who basically proposed that um, there's a single factor in short supply relative to demand can be thought of as a, a critical uh, limiting factor in a species distribution so like a single factor like food or water or space to live can create a critical limit in species distribution and determine where you're going to end up or if you can even survive later um, Shelford came and explained that well each environmental factor that von Liebig was talking about well organisms can exist within a minimum and maximum level of that factor and that creates what we call our range of tolerance. So let's explore that a little bit. So basically a limiting factor is a factor that determines an organism's niche and ultimately its distribution. And if you can't figure out a way to like get whatever it is that is limited, well, we go back to the big three. You're going to need to move so you can find it, um, like adapt to maybe eating something else or die like those are your three options that's all there is to it so 
within each of these limiting factors in this general idea, we have to talk about an organism's range of tolerance. Now, you might remember this from a previous lecture, but um, let me just throw it out there like this, and I'll use fish as an example instead of these moths, but it still works the same way. So in terms of an organism's range of tolerance, well, let's say I have a tropical fish that really likes 75 degree water. If the water is 75 degrees, well, then I'm going to have my fish population right here in the middle of this graph at what's called the optimal range, okay? At the optimal range, everybody's happy. Reproduction is, well, going strong, and the population can grow. Well, what happens if it gets too hot? If I add five degrees, I go from 75 to 80. That's going to move me on this graph this way to a zone of physio physiological stress. So when you're in a physiological stress zone, the adults in the population will still survive, but maybe eggs don't hatch at the same rate they used to, or the young die without reaching adulthood. So your population struggles and suffers as a result. Now you could persist in this zone of physiological stress for a short time, but realistically the numbers in the population will decline as the individuals have to deal with, again, the big three. Like they're, if they can't tolerate that temperature, they're gonna leave or they gotta adapt or they're gonna die. Like that's all there is to it. If the temperature goes up another five degrees, we get into the zone of intolerance and at that point, like everybody in the population dies. Existing in the zone of intolerance is nearly impossible and at the end of the day, um, it usually leads to extinction. On the opposite end of the graph, things are getting too cold. Now, why is this important to us? Well, as you'll see in our next lecture, um, this limiting factor idea, range of tolerance, all that, not only does it change what the population looks like over time through natural selection um, and you know reproductive successes and failures, but it can also lead to changes in ecosystem structure, the physical appearance uh, of individuals in an ecosystem, the niche abundance in an ecosystem, and ultimately biodiversity. That's coming in our next lecture. For now, let's finish this idea of Darwin and look at competition and then some speciation. So with regard to competition, remember I said species fighting with each other is not a good idea and it will change the population over time. Here's why. So there's two types of competition, interspecific and intraspecific competition. Intraspecific competition is competition between the same species for you know limited resources. So here's two mule deer that are fighting for mates. If you're not strong enough to, well, basically win that fight, you'll not be allowed to mate. And when you die, your genes die with you. That's the end of the story. So whatever you are genetically will be eliminated from that population and that will lead to change over time in what we see in the population. The same is true of these sea lions. So the sea lions in the next picture are going to fight for space on rocks. You know, maybe they need that rock to haul out so they can get warm or escape a predator. So if you're not big enough to like hold your own on the rocks, the same is true of what I just described for the mule deer. This type of competition is usually super, super intense and, well, kind of cutthroat, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, Interspecific competition is competition between members of different species. It's less intense because, well, you know, species have, you know, slightly different requirements. So I guess if you lost the fight, you could always go off and, you know, figure out something else that you could do in order to survive. Um, so we have here a lion and a hyena. Like they fight for the same food source. So at the end of the day, like if you're not a big powerful lion able to defend your food, you're gonna go hungry um, or at least miss out on eating a zebra. Well, that's not the end of the day for you because maybe instead of eating the zebra that your hyena friend stole from you, you can go eat like Pumbaa or something, go eat a warthog, I don't know, okay? Um, so yeah, it's competition and there is some intensity to it, but it's not like before where like, hey, if you're weak and you can't win um, a fight, like you're just done, like you don't even get to mate, so your genes die with you, right? You have options here in interspecific competition. Um, our Olympic Games are considered international competitions because we compete with individuals from different countries. It's a slightly different example in that, well, humans are all the same species, but the prefix of inter and interspecific
um, you know, still means the same thing here. Okay, so moving on, this whole idea of our range of tolerance and competition and stuff and our tolerance limits, like it's super important, right? Um, this interaction really, really affects where species live and the ecosystem structure, the biodiversity, the sheer abundance, and what the population looks like over time, as you can see here from this slide. Now, um, going on to speciation. Speciation is, well, as the name implies, the development of a new species. And this is something that is kind of hotly debated. Some people like, you know, wholeheartedly agree with this and some people don't. It's really just a matter of you getting like on the same plane with what the definition of a species is. Um, a species loosely defined is a group of individuals, right, that are similar in appearance. They have um, enough genetic similarity so that when they reproduce, they can produce fertile offspring, okay? So if you ever have a population of individuals and some of those individuals in that population kind of like violate that rule, like they no longer look the same or they won't interbreed to produce fertile offspring, well, science calls that speciation. Now, how could that happen? Well, geographic isolation is one way that that could happen. You could take a large population of whatever creature and if you separate them into different areas and they're allowed to live in those different areas for long time periods and evolve and adapt to that specific area that they live in, they might end up looking different over time. So different that when you put them back together that individuals in the population don't recognize each other as mates and they refuse to breed. Okay. That, so that's what geographic isolation is all about and what it leads to as those individuals evolve independently um, is what we call allopatric speciation. Here's a visual example of this. We could have a group of like you know squirrels here that um, you know live in a large population in this uh, mountain range that you see pictured here. Well, if there's like a river that cuts through and prevents them from interacting, um, any longer and separates them into two large uh, populations on separate like islands so to speak that's where you could get the variation um, in the population as you know they evolve and adapt to their specific environment and as you see in that bottom picture like instead of having one group of you know squirrels chipmunks here that basically look you know all the same you've got two distinctly colored um, you know, individual populations, and if you were to bring them back together and they refuse to breed, then you got to call them separate species at that point based on the definition that science has created. Okay, so speciation, right? That's just the formation of a new species, and when it happens through geographic isolation, we call it allopatric speciation. Here's another type of speciation, it's called sympatric speciation. Here, organisms actually still live in the same place but they become like genetically isolated from each other. We don't see this a lot in animals, but we do see it in plants. There are ferns out there that literally have hundreds of chromosomes like in their gene set. And you know, even though they have hundreds, they only use like a small fraction to survive. And sometimes what happens is, is one set of chromosomes or genes will get turned on and another one will get turned off. So if I had two ferns sitting next to each other and this one's on gene set A and this one's on gene set B, they may not be able to interbreed any longer. That's sympatric speciation, okay? Now, we can also see some selection pressure put on populations that again, can not only lead to speciation, but differences and changes and evolution over time. These types of selection come in three forms. We can have directional selection, stabilizing selection, and then um, disruptive selection. So directional selection is a shift in a population um, towards one extreme. So if we took a large population, separated into islands, and then there was some sort of directional selection that occurred in each of those respective islands, that's where we could see two very distinct populations over time in allopatric speciation. Stabilizing selection tends to select for an average. So if this was going on, 
Well, it wouldn't matter if you were on separate islands or not. The selection pressure would keep everybody kind of around that same like middle ground, okay? And um, they'd still basically appear identical. You could also end up in a case, right? You could also end up in a case where you get selection for both extremes at, of, of a, a particular trait in a population at the same time. That's disruptive selection, okay? So at disruptive selection, you're gonna get like um, opposite ends, right, of, of the extreme. So maybe like a bird with a big beak, you know, is favored, and at the same time, a bird with a little beak is favored for a different food source, but if you're kind of like in the middle, like you're, you're out of luck. So that's just an, another case of where like selection pressure can lead to change over time. All right, gang, so that's Darwin, that's natural selection, that's how um, populations can basically change over time through things like physiological stress, competition, right, and lead to like speciation. So I'm going to stop here and um, I'll pick this story up of chapter six with ecological niches and all that community structure in our next series. Uh, these videos are always available for Mr. Kennedy's webpage. Handouts for them are on our class webpage. So um, I'm checking out. I'll see you next time.